Hey everybody, this is Tony, and I'm here today with a special guest, Miss Sarah Dash. How are you today? I am fine. Well, it's good to be speaking to you today. I'm sorry? I said it's good to be speaking to you today. Oh, it's, it's thank you. The same here. <laughs> okay, now, uh, people most notably know you from the famed group LaBelle, with Patty LaBelle and uh, Nola Hendricks, um, and you all were a group from uh, the 60s all the way to the 70s, and you had hits such as Somewhere Over the Rainbow, you Never Walk Alone, and of course, Lady Marmalade. Yes. Um, what was that time like being for you in a group um, back then? It was the thing to do uh, back then as we were teenagers to be in a singing group. It was very exciting. It was a very exciting mm -hmm. time, uh, having come out of uh, school, in school and to be... Uh, you know, able to do that and travel was great. Okay. What was what was the favorite uh, part for you? Like, uh, was it the recording? Was it the touring? Was oh, it... they all, uh, the traveling and the performing went together, and it was exciting to go to different cities and to appear with, uh, you know, in different towns and to come back and to speak about it. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the road uh, traveling. Uh, the recording, I loved as well. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, it all was a part of what we did. And each time it would be, uh, it was exciting uh, to me uh, for recording is because that we got to work with different uh, producers and we got to sing different songs. We got to learn new songs, learn new parts, and uh, okay. we never knew how it was going to turn out. And when mm -hmm. when you heard the finished product, that's why it was exciting to me because we go in and we're singing, and then it's being mixed, and you say, "Wow, we did that! Look at that!" Right, right. You know, so the tr so the three components uh, fit in one piece. Uh, it was one piece for me. It all was important. Okay. And I loved it. Now, all right. <laughs> Now, when you first uh, start, when you guys first started out recording, did you know anything about the music business itself? Only from what I heard on the radio, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and that would mean only in music, only in hearing. I knew very little about the business, except I did know that as a minor, I had to have an adult uh, sign for me. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew that um, it required um, what I knew of the business was very little as. We started out, we had stardust in our eyes, so we had sort of like show business stardust. But as we became more mature and we saw what it took, then we, uh, then I became more of a business-minded person and thinking, you know, what the development was and what it took to have, um, you know, to run uh, an operation to get on the road. And so these things come with time age, awareness, mm -hmm. you know, they soon become more important because you realize that you have to look out for yourself. You have right. to make sure, um, even though there's a trust factor that goes in that, that you think everything will be handled, sometimes you have to face the disappointment of something mm. not being handled. Um, uh, one time, a, few, a couple times, there uh, we were faced with the fact that the promoter ran off with the money. Uh, so these right. things happen, even though we had a manager and a chaperone who traveled with us uh, because, you know, we were underage. Um, we still face those kind of things, you know. So mm -hmm. n learning the business, it's uh, a daily process, you know, okay. just as technology changes the way some contracts are handled or changed, you know, there's no one set rule except that you're mm -hmm. part and you're the commodity that they count on to bring the, you know, business to fruition, meaning the making of the money, you know. Right, right. Now, uh, in the early years, did you all, you, do you all have a creative control over the type of music that you uh, recorded? Very little in the beginning. Very little. Okay. Um, we were always uh, at the mercy of what the producers would bring to us. 
uh, some mm-hmm. of the songs that we learned. Okay, so when we get to like somewhere over the rainbow, mm-hmm. uh, you never walk alone. These are songs that our manager taught us to sing, and because okay. and we would include them in our repertoire, and they would always have such an effect on the audience that when the record company producers and record companies saw that that what we were doing, um, they decided that they, we should go in the studio and record this stuff. And so as Patty LaBelle and the Bluebells, we did an album for, they were called albums back then. Um, right. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. For Atlantic Records, where we did nothing but the classicals over in the rainbow and, you know, just wonderful music. Um, and those things were presented to us and we work with people like Jerry Wexler, um, uh, you know, Bobby Martin, uh, um, you know, um, those were the, the crux of our development as Patty LaBelle and the They were the people who um, would say, oh, girls, I think you should do that. And, you know, there were a few original songs in the beginning, but they really were choosing our material. Uh, mm-hmm. And we learned it. Sometimes we learned it on the spot. Sometimes they said, okay, I'm going to teach you this song. We go into the studio. There were times when we went into the studio, we're going to teach you the songs. Okay, this is the harmony. And bam, three hours later, we would be standing in the mic on the mic. That's what we did in the 60s. Right. As we um, morphed into LaBelle, it was more control. We had more control. Of course, we had a strong sounding board, which was our manager, who also brought songs to us and encouraged writing and all that. Um, so it was a little different. But in the beginning, yes, back to your original question, yes, um, we had very little control. Uh, and I don't even think as young artists we knew what that was. Mm-hmm. So it, we thought it was the norm, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now what was your favorite song to record um, throughout the whole group? Throughout the whole entire time of of La Belle, or and, right? I enjoyed the classical songs. Um, um, I loved uh, I love Lady Marmalade, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, not only for the musical content, but for the lyrical content. Um, I loved uh, singing things sort of like it's just an all-girl band, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, I, to say what my favorite was, I just enjoyed the music um, tremendously. Um, it had, uh, there was not one song that I... And I say this from the bottom of my heart that I hate it because I love music. Okay. You know, each time, each each project was a different time. Um, and Patty would get in there and she would never cease to amaze me. And, you know, it was just one of my favorite all-time listening songs of LaBelle. Uh, it's not only, is it Lady Marmalade, of course, all the stuff that Alan Toussaint did. But um, Wild Horses, have you ever heard LaBelle's rendition of Wild Horses? No, I haven't heard it yet. Yes, if you could hear that, and then you would understand. There was a time where I would not start my day. After prayers, I would start my day with Wild Horses. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. Now, in uh, 1974, Lady Marmalade was a big hit for you guys. Um. Now, but I seen an interview with uh, Patti LaBelle, and she said that you guys didn't even know what the song meant, but you were singing it. Um, uh-huh. When she, uh, she, um, I'm not sure she really meant that, but uh, if that's what she said, then that's, that was her feeling about it, I guess, you know. Uh-huh. But I, um, when the song was given to the group, I was in, I was in the I was on vacation. They vacationed in California, and they were invited to Bob Cruz's home for dinner. And mm-hmm. they told me about this song, and immediately I went, well, what does it mean? So okay. I had a me I, I knew what it was saying, you know, will you sleep with me tonight? 
I knew exactly right. what that meaning meant. Uh, it had a change when we were doing things like the Merv Griffin show or some shows. You probably don't even know who these people are, but like the <laughs> show and stuff. They had us change it because there was what they call a licensing for lyrical content. It was a um, they had uh, these monitors where there were certain things you couldn't say on TV. Sometimes mm-hmm. we could bring them back, but um, we had to say "Vule Buku." Instead of saying "Vule Buku Shay," we had to say "Vule Bu Danse," which meant uh, "Will you dance?" Avec moi, you know, with me tonight, you know. Mm-hmm. So the, having those monitors, um, uh, which is so different for today, you can just say anything. I'm just, you know, anything today. <laughs> <laughs> well, to a point, you know. Right, right. But uh, did I answer your question? I know I went all over the place. You did, you did. Okay. okay. Okay, uh, now, what, from you being in a group, uh, you guys were in the group for a good while. Uh, while you were in that group, did you ever feel like it was more um, that you could have done or that you weren't being offered at the time being in a group? Oh, you mean individually? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Um, I, I didn't really feel that. Um... There was a time where I was offered things that I didn't do because I was in the group, um, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to leave the group. I, okay. um, high, in hindsight, uh, mm-hmm. I probably would have still stayed with Nona and Pat to do those certain things, you know, and to come back. I didn't understand at the time when these things were offered that I should go off and do different things and come back because that's what we're doing now. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I didn't, you know, um, I sometimes felt that we as a group could have done more things together, but it was becoming a time where it was time to develop on an individual basis. And, um, I saw where that was going, and that, when I saw that, that was the only time that I regretted not doing some individual things, and okay. I'll stay with the group, yes. Now, from uh, 1960 to 1967, Cindy Birdsong told you all when you all were the Bluebell. Um, now, she then left later in 67 to become a Supreme. And uh, she said that you all didn't speak to her for a very long time because of that. Is that what she said? Yes. Yeah, we're... On an interview that I seen. Really? I didn't even know that. Um, th- when she um, left the group, I didn't think it, we were not speaking. She was on tour with the Supremes. And mm-hmm. our, our, cross, our paths didn't cross. Right. So I... I know, I I can't even recall, but I uh, I know we went to see her and we went to see the group. Or we did for the first time together as a group meet with the Supremes backstage at one of their performances. Mm-hmm. Um, it was odd, but it was still she was still our older sister because she was older than us, and we still looked to her for guidance. You know, as teenagers would, you know, as having right. a bigger sister. But I, I'm surprised to hear that. So was there really a rivalry kind of thing going on with you and the Supremes? I didn't think it was rivalry. I just think we were in different uh, times. Um, you know, they were on Motown and we were on Cameo Parkway. Um, right. They had the Motown tours and we were doing what we did. Um, yeah. Okay. I didn't look at it as a rivalry, but, you know, when you're doing shows like that with many groups, of course, you want to be the ones that steal the show. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, you know, we grew in different uh, directions, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, now, have you all spoken to Cindy in recent years? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, I'm in touch with uh, 
uh, we stayed in touch with her. We, okay. You know, she, um, you know, there are things that um, we did we did to uh, help her. I know when we received our R and D award, she was included in that. Right. And um, because she was a part of that time. Mhm. So now in uh, 1978, you went on your solo career, we all um, uh-huh. and you released your first uh, first album, and you uh, had a top ten hit with your Center Man off of that. Yes. Um, what was that time like for you? Like going from coming from a group and then you go into a solo career. What were you really expecting out of the solo career? First off, I you know, in retrospect, um. You want to be successful in everything that you do, and mm-hmm. I didn't really. Uh, I wasn't looking for. Um, I wanted Center Man as a release to be successful, and it went beyond my expectations. It was right. an international hit. I was everywhere, all over the world. It was a hit. It was a blessing to have that. Uh, mm-hmm. Coming out as a solo project, having it be as big as it was, I was with a great company at the time, Kirshner Records, mm-hmm. and I was, you know, the last to be signed, but the first one to have a major hit. So it was, wow. it was really, um, yeah, it was really, really good um, um, to have that, you know, as a part of my development. You know. Right. Um, now, was it uh, any nervousness or anything like that when you first started uh, your first solo career because you had been with the group so long? See, what, with two people what, being with you. Say that again. I'm sorry. I said, was there any nervousness like when you first started because since you had been in a group so long? Oh, of course. Yes, I was nervous. Um, okay. I was nervous, but you see, I had an opportunity to play places without a recording contract. I was doing sort of like uh, concerts and shows, mm-hmm. uh, developing myself as a uh, a, a solo <laughs> artist. I went and I did shows without a record, and, and there was a lot of interest, you know, right. um, in my development. I, I learned songs that I didn't sing with the group. I played places uh, in New York that were considered cabaret rooms and show rooms. And it was a mm-hmm. different genre of places that it was different from what I had been accustomed to um, playing. Um, I came out of concert halls and just being on stages like the Bitter in um, some other rooms in New York. And uh, yes, I was nervous as I could be, you know. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I did it. I did it. Now, throughout your solo career, um, were you ever unhappy with what you were, uh, with what you were given as far as music? Um, I can't say I was unhappy. There were some songs maybe that I, I, um, didn't think were good, but then here I am, someone who is relying on the expertise of the producers that I work with, the record company, and there were, um, after a time, after a while, I wanted to change, and I started doing different kind of shows. I I went to places like Sweetwaters in New York, um, Mm -hmm. other places around the country. I did some concerts with other artists, it, it takes a minute to establish and develop as a solo artist, and you do that all the time. There's always, and the reason why I say uh, it takes time to develop because you, it's important to have a great team around you to right. support you, a great agent, a great PR person, a great producer, a great worker company. And mm-hmm. um, there are things that you as an artist feel that, feels better to you than it feels to them, but still 
not knowing and not, you know, are relying on the resources and the uh, knowledge of those who you work with, you you develop a trust factor, and you trust that they will give you the best promotion. You trust that they will give you the best um, music or your your individual talent. Um, right. There's some uh, like uh, there was one song that um, my record company turned down, and, and I had rehearsed it and worked with the writer, and that song was. Uh, it's rain and men. Mm-hmm. They didn't think it was a good song and think the DJs would play it. And of course, tons of fun came out and they had a huge success with it. Right. I right. wanted to do the song. I thought it was great. It's rain and men, but they didn't. <laughs> they didn't see it, and and it became a hit. And and no one spoke about it ever. <laughs> it was like <laughs> the elephant was in the room. <laughs> right. But they knew you were right all along, that's why. Well, I was right because history prevails, right? Yep, that's right. <laughs> now, at any time um, during your solo career, like first starting out, later starting out, like what, any time, um, was there at any point did you feel like um, your voice wasn't good enough or you won't do good enough or, you know, anything like that? Well, I was told by um, a uh, producer um, who uh, asked me to call him and to send him my first solo album, and I sent it to him in advance. And he mm-hmm. and he sent me a note. Uh, he shall remain nameless at this point. But he told okay. me, he said, you don't have it. You, you're trying to sing like Patty. You're trying to do what she did. And I'm like, no, um, I wasn't trying to do it. So when Center Man was a hit, he apologized to me many years later. He said, "I wish I had gotten, um, I had gotten. I, I wish I, I had really become a part of what you were doing." He said, "Because you really do have a talent, and that can affect you when people mm-hmm. compare you to the people that you've worked with. Um, right. It does have an effect on your, you know, your psyche." And um, there were times when people said to me, oh, you're, you're not doing this because you're trying to be like so-and-so. And I never tried to be anybody but myself. I've, I have always looked at my, my talent as it takes three different components to put together a group. And there are always often times there when you do, you're in a singing group that, right. you know, there's, going to be one that will be compared to, you be compared to others, like groups are compared to other groups. And mm-hmm. so when it became a, a time for someone to say to me, oh, when someone, when this one person said to me, oh, you don't have it, because you're you're young and you're naive, naive and you, you know, you look to them for the type of uh, knowledge that you want from them. I think it's a mistake to say to any artist, you don't have it. You can easily say, you're not what I'm looking for at this time. And that right. happens a lot when you are auditioning for parts in the industry or a role in a movie or, you know, um, I was told at age 28, I was too old. Um, wow. You know, I mean, and now look at where we're going. You know, mm-hmm. there was a time, and there still may be a time, where there are certain people who are looking for a young artists only. And with the young artists, you they don't have the knowledge of the business, so you can it could be it, it it could work in other people's favor, not to have them know what their demand should be because it's more beneficial for them. But I think, exactly I think you know it's important even when I work with. I, I teach vocals. I'm a vocal okay. coach and and a vocal instructor, and I've worked on projects uh, developing background harmonies for different projects, which I don't even talk about or give myself credit for, and I and others haven't either. But that's okay. But it makes me smile when I see that it has gone to another place. Uh, Big mm-hmm. Daddy Kane was one of my students. Okay. I had a uh, student that I trained all the way in Australia, and we did it all through sound. Um, I would go in the studio and work with him from the studio. There was a connection. We started that connection before Skype, 
to teach them different vowel sounds and what have you. Right. And, um, you know, um, having the ability to train others to sing it just gives me very, um, it lets me know that we, that uh, when a person comes to me and says, oh, I would love for you to train me, then mm -hmm. it's up to me not to say, oh, you can't sing or I, you don't have it. I oftentimes, I sit down with a person who may have challenges or who may be seeking um, to do certain things, and I just, I, I have a way of training them or talking to them that says, what is it that you want to do? What do you want to achieve in mm -hmm. working with me? I don't say working for me or me working for you. We have to, it has to be a conscious effort of connected, a right. connected okay. effort. And you, you look at what they want to do. What do they want to achieve? If a person comes to me, they have, have a rock-sounding voice, and they want to do, say, blues. Okay, so bring me the music that you want to be able to sing. Tell me what it is, and let's see what we can achieve to get you there. Let's see how we can get you there. Mm -hmm. You're not with a label. If it's something you want to develop, you want to go a certain into a certain area, I work with them to get them to the strongest vocal place they can get. When they feel that they've had enough, that it is always their call because I can't tell people how to spend their money. When they feel right. that they have gone as far as they want to go with me, it is some mutual understanding and it's not like anger or we parted negative in a one negative level. You know, this mm -hmm. is as far as I can take you, and they go to the next level, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's because I know what that feels like, having someone say, you don't have it. I may not be what you're looking for, but I've come with something, and that's how I look at my students as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, now, when records are doing good, money is doing good, everybody's happy. Um, now, when those records are not doing good that you're releasing, uh, everything's not looking up, how do you continue to go on in a business like this? Well, it's not that it's not looking good. It's not being promoted. There's always a reason why you don't hear a record. There's always right. a reason why you don't see people performing. There's always a reason why they're not visible. It's because the right element is not behind them. They have either made bad choices for people to help them or mm -hmm. uh, there's a lack of understanding with the people that you're working with. And when records are not are no longer being played, say, for instance, this year, the sales on a lot, or last year, the sales on a lot of the songs that were released did very poorly in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, they're... Um, there, when that happens, when my music was no longer being played, I will speak for my individual place. Okay, so you're hearing, I'm setting this up for something, for okay. your answer. When the records are no longer being played, you should be, you should have established or have been able to place yourself in a position where you can continue to do what you want to do anyway. It's okay. hard out here um, to be always on TV, always on the radio, and when the music is not being played, you have to think in longevity terms. Okay, suppose this mm -hmm. doesn't do well in sales, will I still be able to go out and sing and perform? will I still be able to maintain a lifestyle that's comfortable? Will I still be the questions that one should ask? And right. when that happens, you should, one should be prepared to be um, secure within themselves. But unfortunately, we're in a business where 
even the top selling artists have a problem when they don't do the same sales. So Mm -hmm. I always go to a place, Johnny Mathis, who had hits in the 50s and early 60s. Right. He still works. He still performs. You work off of what you've done. Um, Some people were saying to me, you're only as good as your last project. Mm -hmm. That's not true. You're always good. You're always always important. We you have to look at things from a spiritual place. You know, okay, so I'm not because I'm not a what they would call consider uh, a, a top draw, where can I draw? If it's not what you what an agent considers the top draw, what level of draw can I still be able to go out and work my craft with? Exactly. You know, where can I still make a living? Where can I still have a decent lifestyle? Where can I still perform and still wake up in the morning and feel good about myself? Mm-hmm. It is not always and every every day everybody's going to love you. Some people may hear this interview and hate what I'm saying. But on the real tip of life, art is really a God-given gift. It is a Mm -hmm. universal spiritual gift that many don't have. And the folks in the industry or even as a side chick or as a hobby, you still love to do it. You You should find ways to keep your inner spirit healthy and happy. If you're Mm -hmm. looking to make money, we are born with many gifts. Some people can only sing, they think, but they also like a certain style of this, a certain smell of this. Mm -hmm. They have the ability to write songs. Everything is not visible in this industry. Most of the songwriters are not visible. You know, so when things are not happening the way you should, you want them to happen, there's other places in your life, other talent that you have that you can bring to life, and it gives you a sense of satisfaction that you are still promoting the art form in which you are known for, you know? Mm-hmm. I hope that, no. does that answer your question? It does. So thank you for that answer because you gave a lot of insight and a lot of great things in that answer. So thank you for that. The other thing, Tony, too, this is what I feel that artists need to do today. When you're making a lot of money and you are able to command and demand a certain dollar, Mm -hmm. we're in this business called show. But so many times, it's frivolous as well, and it's bleeding. Fame is fleeting. There are things that we must do, and one of the things that we should do is to find a great way to invest what we make. Absolutely. To not, if you, because if fame happens to you at a young age, and if you were at a job, you would have a 401k. Why don't you have one one while you're making money? Why don't you establish some sort of investment so that when it stops, you can still live and you don't have to rely on social services or any of those things? Mm-hmm. Pay your taxes. You know, invest your money. Put your money where your mouth is, and that is your future because... If you can do it at 21, why can't you still be able to live in a decent manner at 35? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the one thing that I like to see change within us as a people in this business. We got there, there, they're saying, you know, Ford failed 99 times before Ford, the car, was a success. So you exactly. have those pitfalls. There's no way of getting around it if it's 
you know, there is always a struggle in development. So that's the one thing that concerns me most. And I'd like to say, you know, to those who are out there, you know, um, be cognizant of your dollar sense, of your of how you spend money and how you and what you do. Because when your record is on the radio, people give you so many breaks. And then when they don't hear it anymore, there's a, there's a demand. And that, 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 that can hurt you, uh, hurt your family. And, you know, mm-hmm. some people turn to things that don't help them. It just damages and destroys them, you know, yep. as a people. Now, what do you think of the state of music today? I think it's, uh, I'd like to hear a lot less. Uh, something <laughs> you know wouldn't like to see I wouldn't uh, I think the music is today is another art form of music um, I think with the technology part of it I enjoy I love you know the way I wish that, okay what I would like to see is the more of a natural I would like to see more natural instruments being used okay more live instruments being used. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I love jazz and and blues because it's like you got to play, you've got to hear, you got to be sophisticated. I think you hear the augmentation of chords and and where they're going uh, on an instrument level or a vocal level. You know, mm-hmm. how you surround the different instrumental sounds with, you know, it, it's just very, um, the growth is very, it's beautiful for those who are in or or exercising that form of music. Um, rap has taken a really big form, art form in the industry today. And, mm-hmm. uh, it's sometimes have negative connotations to how they speak about us as women. That part right. I'm not happy about. Um, yet, on the other hand, it's feeding some of their babies. So I can't say it's wrong. I just hope it's mm-hmm. being, I hope and trust that it graduates from a level of, of um, security you know, Mm -hmm. that it has a form of security for their life form. And, um, you know, and it it is amazing because, you know, I'm I'm an older, um, I I shouldn't say older, I'm I'm mature (laughs) in age, but I have a very young outlook on the art form that comes behind, that has come behind me. Right, right. You know, and... uh, I think that I think it's exciting when I look at the MTV awards, and there's always controversy on um, different levels of of um, award shows and 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 different uh, artists who win and come through. That's very exciting for me. And you think about that, and you go, somebody else has um, been given recognition for their art form. So exactly. there are some people who just, oh, I hate this and I hate that. Because it's not something <laughs> you can't hate what somebody, what their calling or their gift. You may not like it. There's people out there who may not like what I do. Mm-hmm. But, you know, my music has been sampled by Kanye West. My, you know, <laughs> a different, I can name different artists. And I was just so sorry. I was just so um so uh, amazed that they recognize my art form and, you know, um, there is like a circle that never ends. It goes around Mm -hmm. and around and around, you know. Absolutely. Now, with the new era came a lot of new things, and reality TV is now one of the biggest things out. I, wait, your voice is getting muffled again. Can you start that question again for me? Okay. I said now uh, with the new era came a lot of new things. 
and now reality TV is a big thing out now. Um, now, do you happen to watch any of those reality shows? The I okay, the reality show. I saw uh, what is the cooking lady? What's her name? Is cook Miss Toot Miss? What's her name? She cooks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I saw Atlanta Housewives. I'm trying okay. to this other lady's name. Um, there I watched the Brax and I've watched. Um, and there are some I've watched. Okay. Uh, what do you want to know? How do you feel about these shows? Because uh, as far as a lot of people saying that, you know, the shows um, are making black women look negative and, you know, with the fighting or sometimes cussing or whatever. Um, so how do you feel about watching these shows? And what do you, when you see these things, how do you feel about them? It's, again, it's uh, the reality shows with Snooki and Doctor, what is it, one of the, got Run, D, Run Show, um, Mm-hmm. I think it takes a very strong individual to really, you know, um, to to want to put that there. It started with Ozzy Osbourne, right? Um, when Sharon came up with the thought of putting that on, it was so different for us to see that, and it was such an amazement. I sat in amazement, going to. I want to have a camera follow me around my house. You know, a camera sitting in my face right now as I'm talking to you. Um, (laughs) I just think um, it it has helped some people. The Kardashians, they have theirs. Um, It seems to be what's going on today. Um, I I have a, a thing about me, myself, personally, um, I don't like women being referred to as certain words and certain things. I mm-hmm. I come from an era and time which I've had to let go of some of my thoughts because I won't tell you who said it to me, but some antiquated thoughts you have there, Miss Dash, was said to me once, <laughs> and I said, okay, maybe I'm being too verbal about this or being too vocal about this. Mm-hmm. Let me see how this is a part of the American life. And I'm not against it. As long as it makes you happy, I'm happy. If that's okay. what America wants, I want it too. I mean, <laughs> because what's going on it sparked my interest. I looked at it. I look at some. I don't look at others. I, um, I'm i not willing to say that this is the best reality show or this is the worst reality show. Mm-hmm. I like things and I like, you know, like the Empire show. Some or There are some people talking about that. Some people mm-hmm. talk about scandal. Some people are talking about how to get away with murder. Some people are talking about... Um, the first lady, you know, um, they're talking about um, different um, different um, art forms that are on TV. They, you know, they have, you have different tastes when it comes to that. But, mm-hmm. um, I don't think it's anything other than what is in demand. If America wants it, as we know these networks will only put on what sells. Exactly. So um, reality TV has probably taken um, a lot of, put a lot of actors and actresses out of work Mm -hmm. um, just as, um, you know, how different art forms have taken away from other artists, and I'm glad there are um, people who stand up and say, you know, they want this or they want that, because there are many, with all of this going on, there are many people, and there are some uh, who say it's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not, I can't, I can't say it's wrong. 
I, I, you know, I support what I support, you know. Exactly. Because you got the survivor, you got the bachelor, that's another reality show. You got, you know, top models, that's a reality show. Mm -hmm. People willing to come on and do those things. You got the voice, you got American Idol, you got the Real Housewives of Atlanta, Real Housewives of New Jersey. You know, the Jersey Shore, all these different things. Yep. <laughs> um, the Bachelorette, you know, Dancing with the Stars. You know, it's a, I, I'm so happy with Patty on there. And, and, and I'm there with her. Speaking of, you know, us being connected, it's like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm there with her. They used our pictures uh, when they did our interview last week. Um, okay. Her opening song was Lady Marmalade. And um, those are competitive shows, Uh, you know, The Voice and American Idol. But, you know, it's what is selling at this time in our society, you know? Right. Now, if somebody... I'm sorry, Coach Go ahead. No, go ahead. If somebody came up with the idea to uh, give you a reality show or give uh, you, Patty, and Nona a show... Uh, would you agree to it? I've been asked to, um, I was asked about four years ago to do uh, a reality show, you know, uh, about, um, you know, and be, being where I live, you know, coming um, into my town, coming back to my town where I grew up, restoring properties and looking after you know, certain things within the family structure and okay. what does it feel like to be back here and all that. And I I, re- I turned it down. I refused it. Um, um, I just, I could not have cameras around me all the time. Um, I didn't think that it was to my best interest to do that. Um, okay. It, that was my own personal feeling. Um the dollars and the what they were offering was it, it it seemed inviting on one hand, but you know would I be able to handle it? I couldn't. I didn't want to do it. Okay. Uh, and yet I, and yet there's a part of me that will always go, ooh, I got Sarah. Somebody will call me up and say, Sarah, you should uh, you need to go and 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 um. You need to look at this tonight, and this is on tonight. I'm going, oh, okay, great, great. I'll watch it. And I go, why did you ask me to look like that? Because they were going to have this on there, and I thought that may make you laugh. Yes, it made me laugh. <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> do it, but it, I wouldn't do it. It made me laugh. It, it, it lightened my heart. Uh, to, right. <laughs> you know, it, a reality, when you look at what's on the schedule, you know, it's a, it's a it's a lot of reality going on. You know, absolutely. And different things. I mean, I saw something that was on called Storage Wars, and I was like, Oh yeah, I love that show. They made a show. That, there's a show like this, and then you have Flavor Love, and then you have RuPaul. I love RuPaul's Drag Race. Mm-hmm. I think it's so much fun to see the transformation of these uh, people. It's just great. You know, they got the mob wise. You just, it's on and open, you know? Yes, absolutely. It's a lot of them. Yes. I just saw something called uh, Chopped. I was like, Chopped. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> Hip hop in Atlanta. It's on and on. It's, it's, <laughs> it's wonderful, but that's what people are really doing. And I just think it's best for you is that they could make a living out of it. You know? Right. Yeah. Oh, no. Um, now, listen, have you seen the movie uh, 20 Feet from Stardom? Yes, I did. So what did you think of that movie? It was real. I thought it was good. What did you think? I thought it was uh, a great movie. They actually showed your album in that movie, too. Well, um, if you look at the opening picture up there, it's the three of us in those uh, standing there, but they have Chubby Checker's face faded out. We're in the uh-huh. dresses, 
at the very beginning, you see the three of us, Nona, Patty, and myself. Look okay. at it again. Do you have it in your possession? Yeah. Look at the very beginning of it. There's Nona, Patty, and myself. And there's a guy sitting there, but his face is faded out. Mm-hmm. That's the three of us. Look at it. Okay. Yes, we're we're in, we're in that. I wonder if I should try and get my Oscar because we're in that film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but well, I, I think we definitely great. deserve one. Lisa Fisher and Darling, those are people that I mean, like I just did a show with Darling. Okay. For uh, the epilepsy um, candlelight uh, organization. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we did a, uh, with Dawn Robinson, um, Corey Glover, and Doug Wimbush from um, Living Color. And okay. um, I love um, all those singers in there I've met, and to hear their story, it was great. It was a great dose of information. I right. love Lisa Fisher. She's one of my mm-hmm. friends. She's a friend of mine, too. And it was just wonderful to see what that was. You know, there were some people that weren't included. Uh, I would have loved to have seen in it, but what they gave the information was strong enough for people to become aware of what goes on behind the scenes of a recording, the back voices of what supports and the hooks of a song come from background voices and what have you. You know, mm-hmm. I, I well, I think personally that that you should have been on the movie too. Really? I think so. I think it would have been great to see you tell your story. Oh, that's nice. Nice of you to think that. That's great. I, I say that because everybody on that movie uh, provided insight to something you have, may have never known if you had not seen that movie, and you never know the struggles of what someone is going through or what it took for them to get to where they might be. And so I say that because, you know, a lot of people know Patti LaBelle as a household singer. Of course they know she was in LaBelle, but they may not always remember Nona and Sarah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that I have what you call a second chance name. They go, do you know who Sarah Dash is? Who, you know, the girl from LaBelle. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, and that's okay because it's, I mean, you know, Patty has had the most major success of the three of us. And, okay. But um, we, um, in, in, in good taste, know that we all started together. Right. So um, and the only time I have issue with, with uh, the separation of the names is when, they say Patty LaBelle's big hit. It, um, they sometimes fail to mention that um, she's known for Lady Marmalade along with Nona and Sarah. Uh, when people flash just her picture alone and not the three of us, you know, um, you know, we, it, with all, I'm sure, I'm not blaming her for that, but right, right. press is. It's important when you're reporting that the media gives it the way it should be given. Right. You know. Now, in, in that movie, 20 Feet from Stardom, they talk about all these uh, singers which you named, uh, some that you didn't name, um, but mostly they were saying they were background singers. Mm-hmm. Uh, back- and I want to ask... Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I want to ask you, I don't know if you can answer this question, but what qualifies you as a background singer? <laughs> I don't know. Because, I mean, Patty could sing background on a song. You know, right. we saw that you, if there's a lead singer in the front and um, you're doing the backup vocals, that's what qualifies you as a background singer. There are people who have made careers out of being the best backing background singers in the industry. And, mm-hmm. you know, like the Waters, they sang on so many amazing songs. Absolutely. You know, but... Uh, we as the Bluebells were the background singers. There's a song that Wilson Pickett did many years ago called Three, mm-hmm. Six, Four, Five, Seven, Eight, Nine. Mm-hmm. That's that's that that's the Bluebells. Patty Labelle and the Bluebells singing background on that. Okay. You know, you, if you do some research on that, 
Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, that's, we get back up, and then the end you hear Pat step out singing, you know, why don't you call him? You know, she larry mm-hmm. away. You know, <laughs> that happens. Well, such a good I asked that because I, I know Lisa Fisher was on the movie, like you said. Yeah. And Lisa was a background singer, yes, but Lisa had a solo career, too, so I didn't understand what that was about. Well, have you interviewed her? I have not. I've been trying to get her on here, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. She, um, Lisa's done some fabulous work. She's the absolute, she is astounding. Even the work she did in the film, mm-hmm. it was so good. Absolutely. Oh, I, I think if I can only have, um, how can I ease the pain in my playlist, when I, I think that would be good enough. Again. Jeez. Exactly. Oh, oh my lord, that girl. <laughs> she and Patty were they were tied for the Grammy for that uh-huh. year. You know. Oh yes, I do remember that. I seen that yes. video. Yes. And but, you know, I'm not I'm not old enough to be there, so <laughs> I have seen the video. <laughs> but uh, Lisa, um, she goes out with the Rolling Stones. Well, uh, I. They had uh, the three of us, uh, Bernard Fowler, Lisa Fisher, and myself, we sang on the Steel Wheels um, mm-hmm. uh, for the Rolling Stones. We did the backing vocals for that. Um, I did backups with Keith Richards on his solo projects and some lead vocals. Um, so, it, it, you know, uh, going out with him was a highlight of my of one of the highlights of my career. Um, and that was like a sort of backup session, and I would, we did like, we did the tours together, and I did backups and then stepped out to do the duets with him. So it's, mm-hmm. it's um, that's what qualifies you as a backup when you're doing that, you know. Right. So and, do you consider yourself a background or a solo singer? I call, I call myself, I, I I have the capacity and the ability to do both. Okay. So you would, you would uh, solo artist first, backup singer first, you know, group singer, choir singer. Right. <laughs> you know, all those are the categories which I fit in, okay. you know. Now, what would you say has been the uh, best piece of advice you've ever been given throughout your whole career? Family first. Okay. Family first. Um, mm-hmm. In regards to the music, Jerry Butler told me, always say or tell it through the eyes of Sarah, and you can never go wrong. Exactly. You know, um, Jerry Butler is probably before your time. How old are you, Tony? I'm only 18, and I'll be 19 this year. You are an amazing spirit to be able to hear the history of of music and want to be a part of interview it. Are you a singer yourself? Um, no, I don't sing. I would love to, but I don't sing, actually. So what do you plan to do with your life? Are you going to college? or? Yes, I'm in, I'm in college now. I'm um, studying psychology. I study psychology in college. Um, not in college. Well, I guess I was in college because it was a college <laughs> course. Um, but um, what do you what do you plan to? I mean, you're you're doing these interviews, and I assume it's for a college station or. Mhm. No, no, no. It's not for a college station. It's for just the YouTube. But I started this on my own um, about a couple of years ago. And um, me and my cousin was doing it first, and we had got many people, you know, but as soon as we were at almost our peak, you know, we had an internal affair, and she ended up leaving. Wow. So I started over again on my own. Oh, uh, she didn't agree with what you were doing, or? Well, it it wasn't that. It was the fact that I felt that uh, she wasn't pulling her own weight. And I didn't want to be rude and say it, and so <laughs> that didn't go so well. So you had your first taste of show business at age 15, 16? Like, yeah, like 16. Yeah. So now where do you think you're going to take um, the world with this um, 
information that you're gathering and for the love of the music and the art? Do you feel that you could be a psychologist at some point or a psychiatrist at some point? And yep. and also use the other part of your talents in educating the world with um, uh, uh, the art form of show business? I mean, you know. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I say that because <clears throat> ever since I've been a little boy, um, my father, he was a, a person who loved, you know, old music. Well, not old music, but music from behind, uh, from 60s, 70s, you know. Uh-huh. And ever since I've been little, I've been listening to this kind of music all the way up until today. You know, my sister or my mother, anytime they hear me playing music, it's something, whether it's Aretha or Patty or Marvin or you know, whoever. You know, it, it's always somebody, you know, from the 60s or the 70s mm-hmm. or the 80s or wherever, you know, not from today. Mm-hmm. And so uh, me doing this is my opportunity just to learn from you all when I talk to you. Because if you notice, well, you don't notice, but uh, a lot of the people that I interview are people who are, you know, like uh, new artists. Mm-hmm. It's people like yourself, and I'm supposed to be doing an interview today with Miss Linda Clifford. I don't know if you. Oh yes, her I know Linda. Yeah. Okay, well I'll be doing an interview with her that, today also. That is wonderful. That is wonderful. I would say pioneers and 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 classical artists is your uh, genre here. Okay. Yes, you know, it's just like getting back to reality TV. It's like it's a program. You know, these programs are unscripted. And mm-hmm. there are actual occurrences as we speak. And you never know what we're going to talk about, you know, except you do know your cast because you know who you're calling. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, um, I, I, you know, Linda Clifford is a great talent to interview. Um, I did listen to your interview with Melba Moore. I thought it was fabulous. And Melba's, well, Melba's a good friend of mine. And, um, you know, I just I had to ask you those questions because I wanted to know if you in fact um, are um, I, obviously you are you do believe in what you're doing, but mm-hmm. you know I just wanted to know how far you thought you would go within uh, this form of uh, of media, you know. Okay. Well, to be honest with you, I I wanted to first be an actor, right? Okay. Okay, because I couldn't sing, but I love I love music. You love so, drama. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm so sorry, go ahead. I couldn't I couldn't do that, and so um, I didn't really get the acting situation together yet. So this was the next best thing. Oh, okay. And so I love music, so why not learn from the people who did it? Yes. And so that's that's what I've been doing ever since. Now, as far as going somewhere, um. I honestly don't know where this is going to go, but I pray that it goes as far as it can, I can possibly go. Okay. And um, well, you, I just that, go ahead. that's very honest. That's honest. I think that's really good. Excuse me, I just burped. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's, you're human. It's all right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, but honestly, I, I I don't know how far it's going to go, but I plan to go as far as it can take me. And as long as I can provide an insight to you all's life in a positive way, and I can continue to do what I'm doing, then I feel fine about it. Okay, that's good. Well, I, I appreciate your, um, how long is your show on the air? I, I hope well, huh? you, you're all right. You're, it's not a set time, so okay. you're all right. Okay, okay. Okay, so it's an hour show, and you just edit it down. Is that what you do? No, no, no. Listen, I, what it is, it, it's not a, in, in a set um, time. So however long the interview is, is however long it'll stay, unless it's something that you know needs to be cut out or something like that. Mhm. I see. But well, you know, uh, you'll know what parts to cut out and what parts to keep in. Then. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, that that now that's a talent. That is a talent because part of. The music that we do, it, editing is a very important part, you know, mm-hmm. getting it down and pulling up what needs to be cut out, you know, that's, that's a, it takes a lot of, um, it, there's a great, strong talent in that, you know. Right, right. You know, because and you know, it's, it's hard. Doing, 
when you're interviewing, I don't mean to cut over you, but when you're Let's interviewing, you know, sometimes they can, you know, like when you have a script, storylines are, are just, uh, you know, they're generated ahead of time. But you mm-hmm. know, doing this, there's nothing staged or restaged unless we give you a bunch of questions that says, I don't want you to talk about this, I don't want you to talk about that, you know. Right, right. Um, you know, and as long as we don't exploit or humiliate anybody from the other, in other um, capacities, I think, you know, this form of art is really good. And, you know, I find that, you know, we can't call people untalented or unworthy or, you know, and and there are some infamous personalities that we have to deal with on a constant basis every day. In Absolutely. Minutes. But... That's their life, you know, and that's what how they want to do it. Sometimes they have no control over it. But, exactly. You know, I think it's uh, it's all you know the newsworthy parts of life is uh, of this art form is is really something that um, we really um, can't call fraudulent. It's exactly what it is, a reality, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, as long as you don't do any editing that's misleading and you keep it... Right, and that's the kind of thing that I hate. Yes, yes. And you, Well, not hate, that I dislike, because I don't hate anything. Yeah, but, you know, at least you know truth when you see it. You know? Right, right, right. Yeah, and when you hear it. Uh, Miss Dash, I want to thank you so very much for doing this with me today. And I wish you nothing but success. Um, if there's anything that you want to shout out as far as your website, as far as shows, or anything like that, you can do that yeah, at this time. Yeah, I yeah. can I? I know I talk over you because I think real fast. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Um, I'm also doing my one-woman show, which I would love for you to include in this interview. Um, okay. My one-woman show, it's about my life and growing up in the industry and, of course, Patty Nona and most of the artists that I work with who touch my life um, is included in it, and it's called Sarah, One Woman. And uh, I have a director, and he's out of Dallas, and his name is Curtis King. Um, okay. And he's the director and founder of TBAAL, that's the Black Arts and Letters um, Theater down there. And mm-hmm. uh, we're working on scripting this, and we are hoping to have it out by the fall. So okay. I am um, I'm looking forward to that. So uh, that's one of the things that I work on, and you know, with the work that I do and trying to enhance community. Um, hopefully, one day I will get my music and arts. Um, um, school off the ground. If if not, it will be a traveling situation, which is what I do now anyway. Um, okay. I do, uh, different some artists buy me in to give them uh, vocal training. Uh, some they they uh, they come to me or you know I train in New York. So these are the things that are really important to me at this time in my life is to work on what feels good keep the music alive and enhance our community as a people and as a society. Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, we are experiencing some things with the police force all around the country. Mm-hmm. I'm praying for the families who have been struck, stricken by death because of it, and I pray for officers families everywhere, and I pray for whatever needs to be fixed within our law society that it will be fixed. Unfortunately, to bring that attention to what's going on, lives have been lost, and Mm -hmm. and we got to pray that this will not continue, that whatever needs fixing has to be fixed, you know, has to be fixed. Well, um, uh, please let everybody know where they can reach you at as far as um, your networks, your website, and everything like that. I have a website, which is uh, www.sarah-dot-net, and 
spell Sarah with an H, so it's www.sarahdash.net. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. My hashtag for Instagram is hashtag S A R A H A S. I N D A S H. So that's Sarah as in Dash. Okay. Um, well, I have songs on CD Baby, a song called I'm Still Here, which is on my spiritual CD, which is called Sarah mm-hmm. Dash, uh, The Seventh Child. Um, when I'm never I'm performing in areas, you all can come and that's where I sell that. Um, particular CD. We are uh, re-establishing my fragrance company, which is a dash of Sarah, and okay. that will be um, merchandising will be available on my website, hopefully in about three months. Uh, All right. But to purchase T-shirts, my fragrance, my CDs, the best of Sarah Dash, there, um, all these things are being established. And worked out uh, so that um, my listening audience and people who know me can come there and get some personal effects to wear and listen to. All right. Yes. Well, again, I want to thank you for being here with me today, and you've been absolutely great. Oh, thank Uh, you so much. Will you send me the edited version of the show before you air it? I will. I will. Okay. And Just so you can go through and see if you don't want anything else in there or you didn't like it or, you know, whatever. So I'll deal with that. Okay. All right. Well, again, I want to thank you so very much, and you have a blessed day. You too. And if you need more and you need more stuff that you that you come up with, you know, uh-huh. you just email me or call me and let me know. We can reschedule so that we can drop that in, Okay. I definitely will. Thank All you right, so much. Tony. It was a delight speaking with you. May God bless you with his tremendous power. And may he give you the insight and the willingness to be a positive force of our society. Amen. Thank you so much. And you're welcome. Bye now. All right. Bye-bye.